Welcome. This is what is happening on the Sun today, the 6th of October 2011. We have a new region, Region 1313. It has produced most of the activity we've seen in the last 24 hours. Is it going to be our next super region? We'll see. But first, our trivia question. 16 years ago this day, 51 Pegasi was discovered to have a planetary companion. It was the first main sequence star to do so. That planet was 150 times more massive than the Earth, which is probably why it was so easily discovered. However, lots of extraterrestrial planets have been discovered since then. Today's trivia question is, how many? The answer will be given at the end. Since yesterday we've had just three sea flares, two of which though have been fairly substantial ones. All of them have come from region 1313. In the meantime, however, the X-ray background has been dropping steadily, which is not generally a good sign for increased activity. So let's take a look at the various active regions and see what is going on. At the moment we have seven officially numbered regions on the disk. Actually, according to NOAA, we have eight. They claim that region 1307 has returned. Now, there was a small pour there earlier today, but when I just looked, it had gone, so I'm not counting that region. As I say, we have a new region numbered, the region that came over the southeast limb the other day, and that's region 1313. But let's start with region 1305 in the northwest. Region 1305 is getting very close to the west limb, and so it's very difficult to tell what's going on, but it doesn't look as though it's changed very much to me. In the meantime, the region trailing it, region 1306, seems to have decayed yet further, from two small spots to one small spot. Next we'll move on to regions 1309 and 1312 in the northeast. Region 1309 doesn't seem to have changed a great deal. There's been some decay in the trailer part of the region, but some development in the leader part of the region, so that's probably a push. Region 1312 is the large single spot near the limb, and hasn't changed at all as far as I can see. Next we should turn to region 1310 in the southwest. This region seems to have decayed quite a bit in the last 24 hours. It seems to have lost most of its trailer spots, and the leader spot has weakened considerably. There is an unnumbered region emerging just to the east and north of this region, but it's very weak at the moment and I don't think it's going to amount to much. The interesting thing about region 1311 is that what a low latitude it has formed. Much lower than any of the other regions in uh, the south. However, it too also seems to be decaying slowly. The new region, region 1313, is near the east limb. But it's far enough on that we can see some of the structure. It seems to be comprised of two large spots, one leader, one trailer, with some smaller satellite spots in between. Just ahead of it to its west, there is a small region emerging, again unnumbered. Now let's take a look at the continuous development of these regions using the HMI data. First we'll take a look at the Sunspot movie and then the Magnetic movie. And again, I think concentrating on the southeast limb is probably the most productive approach. Note that we have six magnetic regions merging in that southeast area. I understand from the SDO team that the uh, Helium-2304 channel in the AIA instrument has been having some problems, so they're baking the telescope out at the moment, so that's why there's a paucity of data. In the meantime, let's take a look at the low temperature coronal movie, and again compare the level of activity and variability in the regions in the southeast with those in the north. Looking at the high temperature image from the GOES SXI instrument, we can see there's a lot of emission behind the northeast limb, including a huge arch loop above the main active region. Obviously there's quite a lot of activity going on back there, and so when that region rotates on, we should be in for quite a show. I must admit I was rather pleased when the bright streamer that I mentioned yesterday did in fact produce a coronal mass ejection today. You can see it here in the southeast. First in the left hand side is from SOHO, and on the right hand side it's from the stereo spacecraft. So you can see very clearly that the coronal mass ejection is uh, directed both south and east of the Earth, so it's probably not going to be geo-effective. Yesterday we were hit with a sudden impulse. That is a coronal mass ejection with an unfavorable field orientation such that it can't form a geomagnetic storm. So we just get hit by the shock wave. The density of the solar wind has remained very high, the temperature has increased to nearly 500,000 degrees, but meanwhile the velocity of the solar wind has dropped as the impulse moved past us. The high energy electron flux at geosynchronous altitudes has been slowly decaying over the last uh, two days, and we still have had no sign of a proton event. The auroral zone seemed to be a little less agitated than it was yesterday. KP index shows that we were in minor storm conditions during that sudden impulse, 
and NOAA reported a minor geomagnetic storm warning during the last 24 hours. So in summary then, the X-ray background has dropped to the B4 level, the sunspot number has dropped to 100, the radio sun intensity is at 127 solar flux units, the solar wind speed has dropped to 360 km per second with a high density of about 8 proton per cubic centimeter and we've had minor storm conditions in the last day. My forecast for the next 24 hours is that C flares are possible, M flares are unlikely and X flares are very unlikely. The sunspot number will probably drift lower. CMEs remain likely, the solar wind speed will remain low, and a geomagnetic storm is unlikely. In a slightly longer term, we can see there's a minor region about two days off of the southeast limb, and a very large region, the one that's been producing all this activity behind the northeast limb, due back in the north in about three days' time. The answer to the trivia question is 690. That is quite amazing when you think that just 20 years ago we didn't know of any such planets. And it's even more so when you realize that the Kepler mission has identified another 1200 possible candidates. And so in a few months we could have over 2000 planets identified orbiting around other stars. With that rather sobering thought, that's it for today. Keep safe. Bye for now.